This is the Mass of St. Margaret Mary, to whom the Sacred Heart of Jesus appeared in 1689. The epistle is taken from the same epistle as the Sacred Heart of Jesus. From St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 3. Brethren, to me the least of all the saints is given this grace to preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to enlighten all men that they may see what is the dispensation of the mystery which has been hidden from eternity in God who created all things that the manifold wisdom of God may be made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places through the church, according to the eternal purpose which he made in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. For this cause I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom all paternity in heaven and on earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened by his Spirit with might unto the inward man, that Christ may dwell by faith in your hearts, that being rooted and founded in charity, you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, to know also the charity of Christ, which surpasseth all understanding, that you may be filled unto all the fullness of God. The Holy Gospel. Taken from St. Matthew chapter 11. At that time Jesus answered and said, I praise thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and thou hast revealed them to the little ones. Yea, Father, for so it hath seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered to me by my Father, and no one knoweth the Son but the Father, neither does any one know the Father but the Son and he to whom it shall please the Son to reveal him. Come to me, all you that labor and are burdened, and I will refresh you. Take up my yoke upon you, and learn of me, because I am meek and humble of heart. And you shall find rest to your souls, for my yoke is sweet and my burden light. Thus are the words of the Holy Scripture. (laughs) In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. This is the feast of St. Margaret Mary, who suffered many trials in her childhood. She lost her mother early. She later would enter the convent of the Visitation Sisters, founded by St. Francis de Sale. And it's in the convent that, Saint Mar- that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Sacred Heart of Jesus, began to appear to her and chose her to be a victim soul because she would suffer very much. Our Lord even told her at one time, I love you not because you're good, but because you are nothing. And she knew she was nothing. All the saints realize they are nothing, and all the good they have is from God. So she she understood this thoroughly, and she suffered very much because of the apparitions. This is some description of her biography. Some years passed quietly in the convent, 
And then Margaret Mary began to have experiences which seemed to be of supernatural origin. The first of these occurred on December 27, 1673. When she was kneeling at the grill in the chapel, she felt suffused by the divine presence and heard the Lord inviting her to take the place which St. John had occupied at the Last Supper, which was right next to his heart. The Lord told her that the love of his heart must spread and manifest itself to men, and he would reveal its graces through her. This was the beginning of a series of revelations covering a period of 18 months. When St. Margaret Mary went to the superior, Mother du Sommet's, with an account of these mystical experiences, claiming that she, a humble nun, had been chosen as the transmitter of a new devotion to the Sacred Heart, she was reprimanded for her presumption. Seriously overwrought, St. Margaret Mary suffered a collapse and became so ill that her life was despaired of. Now the Mother Superior reflected that she might have erred in scorning the nun's story, and vowed that if her life was spared, she would take it as a sign that the visions and the messages were truly from God. So she did recover, and then the superior had two priests come and examine her. Um, both, both of them, one was a Jesuit, one was a Benedictine. And they both said that she was suffering delusions. So this was also a further cross for her. Because like many of the visionaries that are true, they really ask themselves, was I seeing a devil? Was I just deluded? Maybe I wasn't thinking straight. So they start questioning their own reality of seeing the vision. But it wasn't until a Jesuit priest, Father Claude de la Colombière, Father Claude de la Colombière, who talked with her, and he was completely convinced of the genuineness of the revelations of the Sacred Heart to her. He was to write of the nun and to inaugurate this devotion in England. And then after, when she was 43 years old, while serving a second term as assistant superior in the convent, St. Margaret Mary fell ill. Sinking rapidly, she received the last sacrament, saying, I need nothing but God and to lose myself in the heart of Jesus. So St. Margaret Mary, like all the saints, especially those chosen for special missions like this, they do suffer very much. They become victim souls. But the Sacred Heart of Jesus chose her to open to the whole human race that had at that time, 1600s, Jansenism was already deeply seated in France. And Jansenism had many errors that affected the people. And one among their errors was that God does not give sufficient grace to everyone to save their soul. So in other words, God predestines some to hell. And that's a, it, was a, it was actually sister to Calvinism, the errors of Jansenism. Another of the errors was to go to Holy Communion. One had to be uh, perfect and had to have done sufficient penance for all the sins of their life. So how do we know that? So nobody went to Communion. And the stress of the Jansenist priests was to just overemphasize the justice of God, the judgment of God, the terrors of hell, the terrors of God's punishments. And it was so exaggerated that people lost, many souls were just losing hope. So the Sacred Heart of Jesus, our Lord himself, came, and he came to rem remind the human race through St. Margaret Mary 
Yes, I am a God of justice. Yes, I punish sin. Yes, souls do go to hell forever who die hating me and turning away from me by mortal sin and die unrepentant in that state. But I'm also the God of mercy. And my mercy far outweighs my justice. And the proof of the love of, of the sacred heart of Jesus is that God became flesh. He really took on our human nature in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And this human nature, those hands and feet and that heart of Jesus, his whole body, his sacred eyes, his sacred face, perfectly formed by the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary, St. Jerome says that the body of our Lord was most perfect. He stands about six foot high. He had a, a very strong uh, skeletal system. His nervous system was very acute, very sensitive in order to suffer more for us. So at the time when the hour came for our redemption, he sweat blood in the agony of the garden out of love for us because he saw the horrors of sin against God the Father and the justice he will pay in order to open to us poor sinners the hope of gaining heaven again. And our Lord Jesus Christ bled profusely streams, rivers of blood in the agony of the garden which came from his heart. And then, of course, his time through the unjust trials and then his time in the dungeon being beaten and tortured by the Jews all night long in the dungeon. And that dungeon is a shrine. You can still see that dungeon in a church in Jerusalem. It's actually uh, owned now by the Orthodox, but they left the prison intact the way it would have looked when Christ was there and it's just a dark stone cold prison but as in there they tortured him all night long and then our Lord divine Lord was scourged front and back brutally with three teams of Roman soldiers scourging him and the scourges would have torn off chunks of his flesh exposing even his ribs. Hence, uh, Blessed Mary of Agreda says, they, they could count his ribs. They have pierced my hands and my feet. They have numbered all my bones. They could count the ribs in our Lord's back and in his front side. And this, he was also scourged completely naked. A most cruel and uh, shameful punishment. For the love of our souls. So we just touch the surface of Christ's suffering. And it proves his love for souls. And this suffering should move us to love him in return. Who would not be most grateful. If someone saved their life. And our Lord laid down his life to save us from the fires of hell. To save us from eternal separation from heaven and then he was crowned with thorns there's up to 36 deep wounds in his head and head wounds bleed profusely so our Lord would have had rivers of blood pouring down on him all through the passion all his time on the cross and the Virgin Mary spoke about this to St. Bridget and she said that our Lord throughout the whole passion after he was crowned with thorns the blood just poured into his eyes and the only way he could see was to squeeze his eyes squeeze the blood out and still he would only see a, a reddish film over his eyes and this is truly the Lamb of God innocent Lamb slain for us slain for us poor sinners who by our sins crowned him with thorns, who by my sins scourged him, crushed his heart. We're all guilty, every one of us, and we all must be so thankful. And we must, what our Lord asks in return, I look for one who would comfort me, I look for consolation from my friends, 
and I found none, not even one, to console me. But one did st stand close to the cross, and that was his mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary, who suffered equally with his heart, all that the heart of Jesus suffered. And then we have the whole way of the cross, with the falls, the horrible falls, when he's helpless with his hands tied and his feet chained, he can't break the fall. So when he falls, the way to the cross sandwiches his head between the thorns and the ground and the cross coming down with full weight and speed, crushing the thorns deeper into his sacred head. Normally, as happens every year in sports, men get concussions. They pass out. Normally, our Lord got the treatment of, of something far worse than anything on the hockey rink or the football field or the boxing ring. And normally, he should have, he should have had 20, 30, 50 concussions and just be completely passed out. But he's the divine wisdom. He's not going to allow himself to pass out. Because he thought of our souls. He thought of you. He thought of me. And this is not just poetry. He is God. So he can see far into the future. And every one of us. And that he did indeed. And that was one of the consolations in the garden of Gethsemane. When the angel brought the chalice of consolation. What was that chalice of consolation? It was to see all those souls who will go to heaven because of the passion and his death. So his divine love moved him to go through this. He wanted it because it was the Father's will. He wanted to save us from hell. But he won't force us. And that's that scary thing called free will. Any of us can turn from the love of God. So... But his love is as audiovisual as you can get. And then to be nailed to the tree of the cross in the most brutal fashion through the median nerve and through the hand and then through the feet and then hanging in that position of awful torture, of asphyxiation. You can't breathe. And his, his, also his shoulder which one was it? I think it was the right shoulder. I could be corrected on this. One of the shoulders was yanked violently and dislocated. Not broken, but dislocated. So that added to the whole torture of breathing on the cross, where he had to push down on the nails in his feet, push down on his hands, suspended by the nails, irritating the nail in the median nerve, which would be like, the, uh, the pain of nerves when you bite into ice cream and your nerves hurt in your teeth, that's a little idea. Sitting in the dentist chair and they hit the nerve. The whole body feels it. But here it's much more intensified and every movement just completely irritated and sent shock waves through the body of our Lord just to breathe, just for one breath. So he whistled in a breath and then relaxed, and it, it irritates all the wounds. His back scrapes up again into the splinters of the wood. And by this time, the wind is blowing on Calvary. The sun is eclipsed for three hours. Even the sun is embarrassed at man's ingratitude and deicide. So it becomes windy, and it's much cooler. And what happens to muscles when they've been overextended, and they cool off suddenly, they, they, they bunch up and they um, form monstrous bulges on his legs and in his arms. And the pain of the muscle pulls and forming in, into knots all over his body, which does show up on the shroud. Again, every detail of Christ's suffering shouts his divine love. And say, he told St. Gertrude and St. Mechthild and all his chosen souls 
There is nothing that our Lord loves more than when we meditate on his passion and see his love for real and return that love by affections, adoration, humbling ourselves for our sins, being contrite for our sins, and loving our Lord in return. And then, of course, our Lord didn't stop there. He, he died on the cross at his will, at his time at three o'clock. And then he poured out to us the last of his blood, which was the soldier opening his heart, as was foretold in Scripture a thousand years before. They shall look upon him whom they have transpierced. And his heart was open, and he poured out the last, the last drops of blood and water in his whole body for us. So how, how do we see the image of Christ's love for us? Look at his mother at the foot of the cross, crushed, a martyr, his mother holding the dead body of the living King of heaven and earth, who before whom the angels fall down and adore and chant Santus, Santus, Santus. Those hands that created heaven and earth, the whole universe by his word, lying dead in her arms. If you want a book of the love of God, there's, there's the book to study. There it is. And it's, our, it's my sins, it's our sins. And yet it is out of love for us to rescue us from sin and slavery to sin and the result of sin, which is eternal hellfire and separation from God. So our Lord gave his heart. His heart, the, the, the heart is the symbol of the love. Lovers always show their heart. They draw their hearts. I love you. And, and the heart is the seating place of love. So God took on the heart. And he gave us his heart out of love for us. Greater love than this no man has than to lay down his life for his friends. We can understand that. Lay down your life for your friends. But how many of us are willing to lay down our life for our enemies? That's another picture, isn't it? To lay down my life for an enemy? To someone who attacks me, hates me, wants to take me to court and take all I have? An enemy who wants to do me in? And that's the love we are demanded to have because Christ did it. And he said, if you love one another as I have loved you. And his love was not just for his friends. It was for his enemies because we are all born children of wrath. We're all born enemies of God. When we were all born, we were all born chained in, in Satan's chains and our souls were black because of original sin. We were slaves to the devil at our birth, at our conception. So we were born enemies of God. And then out of his divine love, he baptized us with his precious blood, washed away that original sin, and gave us that union with the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost by sanctifying grace. And yet, how many times have we taken that friendship of God and thrown it? And threw it like a diamond, a one precious diamond, bigger than all the rest, more valuable than all the rest, throwing it into this, off a bridge into a river and think, well, I'll recover it again. The chances are you won't. But how many us poor blind sinners, forgetful of God's love, have thrown away his divine treasure given to us, sanctifying grace. So we have added to his pains and made ourselves enemies by our sins. We make ourselves enemies of God by turning away from him to some pleasure, creature, vanity, whatever it is. That's what a sin is. To turn away from God and make an end, our supreme happiness, out of something of created. So let's ask the heart of Mary. She will teach us how to properly love our Lord. And she will show you what to do. And she'll show you how to do it. And love, there's, there's whole movies, 
novels, stories, songs, plays, operas, all about love, love between two lovers, love between friends. So love is very powerful. And our God has so loved us that even I can, I can go on five, 15 hours preaching the love of God, but that's, that doesn't scratch the surface of what he actually does. He really did die on the cross, and he really in this Mass is going to plant the cross again on the altar and reenact that sacrifice for real in the Mass. That's what the Mass is. And then, after the sacrifice is offered, at the end of the Mass, the priest will give you the very heart of Jesus Christ, the very burning heart that was held in the body of Jesus in Mary's arms when he was a baby, held in her arms when it was split open on, by the transfixion in her, at the foot of the cross. The same heart that came back to life miraculously in the tomb at the resurrection and started beating again miraculously, pumping blood, brand new blood that he spilled out, brand new blood, pumping the new blood through his whole body at the resurrection. All the wounds miraculously cured because he's God. I lay down my life and I take it up again. And he did. And that same heart of Jesus ascended into heaven and stands at the right hand of the Father, pumping before the love of, that heart of Jesus pumps always for the love of his Father and the Holy Ghost. And he wants us to share in that love of the Blessed Trinity. So let's ask the Mother of God. She will show us. She will teach us. And she promises it through her rosary, through her holy scapular, and a great love for the heart of Mary. And that's why our Lord wants, right now, all history is hanging on the heart of Mary. Right now. As long as the Pope will not obey and not consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary with all the bishops, the world is going to keep collapsing. The church will keep spinning out into a diabolical disorientation, which has gripped, certainly, Pope Francis now with this this horrible, scandalous synod taking place in Rome where they bow before idols and call down the anger of God on this world by our Holy Father himself. So <coughs> the answer is the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And Jesus Christ the King wants it that way. He wants his, his mother's heart honored because through her heart, when the Pope obeys, and through the many, many devout rosaries that you offer and all Catholics offer throughout the world will bring about finally, <clears throat> as she promised, in the end my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Pope will do as I said and the flood of graces will flood this earth. And Russia will be converted and the whole nations will come back to Christ the King and acknowledge him in our Constitution. That means the United States, the, the United States Constitution is going to begin with, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, our Lord Jesus Christ is King of this nation. That's what, that's what it means by the peace of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. With the Sacred Heart of Jesus on our flag, and the laws of the Supreme Court, banning abortion, banning euthanasia, banning all this corruption, and upholding the Ten Commandments, upholding the laws of Christ and His Holy Catholic Church of tradition, not the conciliar church. So all this is hinging on the Immaculate Heart of Mary. God wants it this way. Everything hinges right now on her heart. So love her, and she'll bring you right to the heart of our Lord and let's honor St. Margaret Mary today, who suffered very much to make the heart of Jesus known and loved. <coughs> and let's ask her to teach us how to really love our Lord, which comes down in practice to what our Lord said. Whoever wishes to come after me, let him pick up his cross daily and follow me. Pick up his cross, renounce himself and follow me. 
O Mary, conceive without sin. O Mary, conceive without sin. O Mary, conceive without sin. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.